welcome back, everyone. Thank you. And now we have the BDC roundtable, and I'll let Al take it from here. Thank Great. you. Thank you, everybody. I'm Al Offmerg with KBW Stiefel. I'm on the investment banking side. We are happy to be able to have the distinguished panelists here to my right. Um, they're industry leaders, and we thought it'd be beneficial for each of you to kind of hear what they're seeing in the market on the credit market side, and also the, each of their respective public uh, BDCs. Uh, so, John, if you don't mind, just we'll start with you. Kind of introduce yourself, what your position is at the organization, et cetera. Uh, great. Good afternoon. My name is John Klein. I co-run uh, the credit business at New Mountain Capital. I'm president of New Mountain Finance Corporation, which, uh, which is a publicly, publicly traded BDC, has about $3 billion in assets. Uh, hi. My name is Ted Goldthorpe. So I'm the founder of BCE's uh, credit business. So today it's a bit over $8 billion. And I'm the CEO of, um, of, two, of actually three BDCs, but the two public ones are, are Portman Ridge and Logan Ridge. Hi, I'm uh, Matt Stewart. I'm Chief Operating Officer of Oak Tree Specialty Lending Corp, particular is OCSL. Um, and uh, we manage about $2.5 billion across 150 portfolio companies. And I'm Michael Gross. I'm a co-founder of SLR Capital Partners. Um, we're a dedicated private credit investor. We manage about $10 billion of capital. Of that, about two and a half billion dollars is in our publicly traded BDC SLR capital. Thank you. Um, so obviously, industry leaders, uh, important people, wanted to ask each of you, and Michael, I'll start with you. Um, the publicly traded vehicle, you know, is just one part of the overall franchise. If you could, in your own words, you know, describe how the public BDC has benefited being part of a larger platform. Yeah, I think you know, all, and probably all of us benefit from this in that. Um, as a publicly traded BDC, um, we were permitted to get exemptive relief from the SEC, which allows us to co-invest across all of our vehicles. So what that allows us to do is given that we want to make sure that our portfolios and each of our funds, including our publicly traded BDC, are incredibly diverse. We typically have 2% positions. Um, in order to be relevant in our space and be able to cr provide a complete solution for our borrowers, we need, we need, we need to be able to write a check that's larger than the BDC could write on its own. So by virtue of being part of a $10 billion platform, um, the BDC can punch well above its weight. And whereas we can take down a 200, 200 million position across our entire platform, we could then put 20 to 40, 50 million dollars in the BDC and benefit from scale. That's great. Um, Matt, anything you'd like to add on how you've benefited from being part of the, lar the public BDC's benefited from the overall platform? Yeah, sure. Um, and similar to Michael, we have co-investment as well, so we can invest across all of our credit funds. Oak Tree is about $100 billion in credit today. Um, and for instance, during COVID, we were able to invest up to a billion dollars in certain uh, stressed or uh, dislocated businesses during that volatile time. And we did some very successful investing both across Oak Tree and the BDC. Also having a very big high yield and syndicated loan platform, we have a very good insight into public markets. And we were able to take advantage of that this year when public markets backed up a little bit faster in some of the private markets. So just having that uh, bigger scale and 350 um, investment professionals across the platform to lean on for underwriting, sourcing, or other due diligence um, is very beneficial to OCSL. Ted? Yeah, I, just, I would echo all those comments, as well as um, the only thing I'd add is, is I think all of us benefit from uh, the ability to leverage off of our broader industry expertise, due diligence. So when we're doing um, underwriting, we greatly benefit from having uh, uh, resources that we can access that are um, that help us in our investment process. So I think that's if you look at if you look at um, if you if you track like best in class returns in in the BDC space, almost all of the best performing BDCs are attached to a larger platform like all like you like all of our our businesses. John, obviously, you're part of a large private equity firm. Anything else you'd like to add? Well, I mean, I just say um, you know. Uh, New Mountain, like like I think the rest of the panelists here, you know, we, we, we try to do the same thing. We have multiple funds. We're trying to get our ticket sizes up. And I'd say one thing that's going on, you know, big picture in the leveraged finance space is uh, the syndicated markets are closed. The high-yield bond market is, is pretty messed up. Uh, syndicated loans, you know, aren't occurring right now. So it's really valuable to have uh, direct lenders be able to pool, uh, you know, all the their capital across funds and be able to provide solutions and capital for sponsors in an environment where there's just really no other option. And so, you know, I joke that we're, you know, when we think about our business and think about growing, we're just trying to keep up with our clients 
And this environment right now, I think, has, has made that doubly hard. We're trying to keep up with the, the growth of our clients. We're private equity firms, but we're also trying to uh, pool enough capital so we can address the, uh, the, the, the unmet need uh, of, of what, what would have been syndicated loans. Well, clearly, the markets are volatile. That's the understatement of the day here. Um, so I'm an investment banker, so I state the obvious, so uh, forgive me. Um, Ted, how has the volatility impacted your business and how you guys are approaching the world in light of the uncertainty and the volatility that's going on in the fixed and equity markets? Um, so yeah, so it's been, it's been really interesting. In March, the number one question we got from investors was there was a lot of fear that people were going to start cutting spread. So like in 2007, you know, spreads were like L175, you know, coming into the crisis. Um, and there's a fear that with rates rising and people having fixed dividends, they're going to cut their uh, spreads. And the complete opposite has happened. So spreads in our market today are probably 200 basis points wider for middle market originated debt. And SOFR, which is what we price it now, has gone from 60 basis points to 375. So if you look at like a traditional unit tranche, our returns have basically doubled uh, between March and today. So the question becomes credit. Um, and you know, it's a very uncertain environment, but I think all of us, all of, everybody in this panel uh, has a background in, um, has lived, ridden through many, many cycles, but on top of that also has a, um, it comes from a background that's not purely just direct lending. And I think that's gonna serve all of us very well uh, over the next couple of years. So um, you know, we, just, we just did a portfolio review of 300 of our portfolio companies. And the biggest surprise to us was there's no surprises. So our companies continue to perform very well. Uh, we, we, we haven't seen any credit issues yet. It's inevitable that you'll, you'll begin to see that you know, in the future. But um, yeah, returns are basic. You know, like our investors are getting crushed across you know, all their asset classes. And it's a pretty safe place to be. You know, we, we do first lien debt. It's floating rate risk. So you're not taking interest rate risk. And by and large, we feel very, very good about, uh, you know, if there is an issue, where we feel very, very good about mitigating credit losses. Thanks, Ted. Uh, John, anything you'd like to add? No, I mean, just to amplify, amplify something Ted said is, you know, the, the, when we think about our asset class, I joke with investors that, you know, we're one of the best performing asset classes in your book right now because every other asset class is so underwater. And, and the, the number one thing we have going for us besides good credit picking, which of course is important, uh, and also staying very high in the capital structure such that we have compelling uh, margin of safety. The, the number th one thing we have going for us is there's just a massive bull market in SOFR or, or, or LIBOR, <laughs> LIBOR. And that, that's really you know, protected our asset values because uh, the interest rates are going up in lockstep or our interest rates are going up in lockstep with, uh, with the base rates in the Fed. Matt? Yeah, the only thing I would add, I think, um, you know, is we're seeing an interesting origination environment, right, as Ted said, with spreads getting wider. Um, it will get tougher on the liability side as well, as most of us are financed by the banks. Banks have been pulling back both in the syndicate loan market, the high yield market, but also lending to BDCs. And that's why it's important to have a bigger platform like all of us up here so you can have better relationships with our banks and keep that lending facility open and keep your dry powder open. Um, at our BDC, we have $500 million of dry powder today to invest in this interesting environment. Um, we'll see how inflationary pressures, input costs, and everything else in our current portfolios will hold up over time. Um, we feel generally good, as probably everyone up here does, um, but we'll see how long this volatile period lasts. But from an investment um, environment, we feel very good about what we're going to be able to do in the next couple quarters. Michael, anything you yeah, want to add? I agree with all that. I think what, the one thing I would add is that you know, we, we, up until this year, we, we've been living in a period of time where, to use an overused expression, you know, the rising tide has lifted all boats. And frankly, you know, anybody in the credit business did well because the economy is doing well, interest rates are incredibly low, there were no defaults. We've now entered an era where it's all about asset selection at this point. And going back and looking at everyone's portfolios, it's about, it's about asset selection. And that's gonna, I think, be a differentiating factor uh, as we go forward during you know, the volatile markets and importantly, the, the specter of, of, of recession with, with rising rates. So what we're hearing from investors is they're not really paying attention to today's or June 30th reported NAV. They're trying to focus on NAV where it's going to be in six months, 12 months, et cetera. So we've got a group of investors out here. If you look at publicly available information, unfortunately, each of your entities are trading below reported NAV. And so as you think about, you can answer it 
uh, in general or about your own portfolio and your company, how should investors think about the investment opportunity versus the headlines? Because obviously there's some headline risk here. Michael, you want to start? Sure. I, look, I think, and, the, and part of answering this question is kind of looking back at you know prior cycles. You know, in our BDC space tr today is trading like we did back in two, two, 2008, 2009, when people were trading at deep, deep discounts. And admittedly, it was probably deserved back then because every BDC was basically a subordinated lender at that time. Did not have the protection of being senior secured, not a floating rate debt. We've all come full circle. All of us up here, and pretty much all of our peers, have gravitated to becoming senior secured lenders with floating rate debt. So what does that mean? It means there really should not, if you've been a good investor, which most of us have, there should not much be much volatility in mark to market on our portfolios. You heard from one of, one of the panelists here that we're all floating rate. So our rates have all gone up, which more than take into account the volatility in things like the high yield market and the leverage loan market. So I, I personally don't think you're gonna see much volatility in the well-run BDCs, NAVs over the next several quarters. Matt? Yeah, and uh, this gives you an interesting time to invest in the BDC, right, because of the discounted price. And for instance, ours is at 90% of NAV today, um, with the market being up 800. So you have an interesting time to buy a high-quality portfolio that obviously we believe uh, NAV is solid um, at 90% of book, you know, with a you know, call it high single-digit dividend yield or low double-digit, depending where you are on the day. So it gives you a nice opportunity to you know invest in a credit fund at a discount. Um, and again, I'll reiterate the floating rate. You know, we're 90 percent. Mostly everyone is you know, 90 plus. Um, you're going to get that benefit of rising rates with earnings and everything else and that protection if you do have some defaults in the future. <coughs> Ted? Yeah, I mean, like my frustration with our uh, space is I feel like we always get bumped in with all high dividend paying stocks. And so our stocks have all sold off in the last, you know, month or two. And they're, like, they're very, very correlated to what happens with mortgage REITs and commercial mortgage REITs and MLPs. And like the factors that are affecting mortgages right now are completely divorced from what's happening to us. So A, I think, I think you know, it's a really good time to buy because you know, we're thrown into the same bucket as some other people who are facing a different set of challenges. And the thing that people aren't focused on is just, you know, we, we talk about this floating rate uh, feature you know, we're gonna have like 30% earnings growth as an industry over the next three quarters. Like, so people are gonna see huge earnings growth. And the question is, what happens to NAV? And you remember, like BDCs do mark to market. So like my average loan, I think today is marked at like 91 cents. And, we're, and you're seeing us say that today we're not seeing a lot of credit issues. So we have NAV, um, you may see NAV volatility that is temporary uh, because we all have to mark vis-a-vis -vis spreads in the market. But if there's no credit issues, you have NAV upside, uh, as well as you know massive over over earning of our dividends. So you should, from a fundamental perspective, have NAV growth over actually over the next couple of years. If, to Michael's point, if we're you know us as an industry has done a good job at credit selection. Anything to add, John? I, mean, I would just say that I think it's unrealistic to expect that BDCs will be able to hold. Uh, asset value uh, across the board. I mean, uh, to, to play off Ted's comment, if, you, if, if last year loans, the average unit tranche loan was L plus 550, and this year uh, we're, we're earning L plus 700, if you mark that 550 loan to market, you're going to have to mark it down a little bit. I think it's really important for our industry and, uh, to be transparent about what is just natural spread widening and, and what NAV markdowns are related to true credit risk. And, and I think that can really help investors uh, you know, analyze and properly interpret, you know, the book value. So that's something we really focus on uh, at New Mountain. One, one follow-up to that is, is some investors we hear from is say, well, how do we know the book is good? Could you just briefly touch on your valuation process and a third-party, you know, validation and what's your typical process that you go under with a public BDC? John, I'll start with you. I mean, I, I think our valuation process is, is, is very robust. I think the industry is, and, you know, we're, we're obviously, you know, governed by the SEC. And when we talk to, you know, more of our private investors, uh, you know, they, they sometimes bemoan the fact that we're so, um, we're so diligent about marking our book because sometimes uh, their private investors like to pretend. But, but essentially, we, we have outside parties looking at our loans. Uh, we obviously look, look at our loans with our own teams. We have a sophisticated board, as does you know, the rest of the, the panel members here. And so, uh, and then of course we have, you know, Deloitte who's also looking at, at the values for reasonability. So 
I think that's at least four different layers of, of, of sort of valuation control for, uh, for our BDC. And as a person who's been had the opportunity to be in front of each of their boards, I can tell you they're not, <laughs> they're not little wallflowers, I can tell you that. They're not afraid to ask the hard question. Uh, Ted, your valuation process? Yeah, I was going to take a different tact on it, which is, okay. you know, we've done 13 acquisitions of uh, similar like vehicles, and in, in our diligence process, we've never found one that was quote unquote mismarked. So we may not agree on every single valuation, but, you know, there's a pretty rigorous standard that uh, investors have a lot of, like John said, we, we, we have a lot of protections under the 40 Act. Our boards are liable for valuations, so obviously our boards take this stuff very, very seriously. And, you know, all of us use third parties to value our assets. So. Um, you should feel very, very good that when you buy BDC, the valuations are the valuations. Like, I feel very good about that as an industry. I, I, I may have said something different 10 years ago, but I think today, <laughs> I think, you know, look, who, look who's running the BDCs now. Like, our world's institutionalized. So, you know, it was started by a bunch of, um, you know, the sector was really started by a bunch of entrepreneurs. And now, if you look at who's the biggest BDCs, they're all institutionalized uh, players. So, you know, KKR, Carlyle, Blackstone, they're not going to, they're not, you should feel very, very good that they, they, are, they take valuation incredibly seriously. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's, that's all throughout the space. Matt? Yeah, the only thing I would add, I mean, obviously we have the same procedures that they have. Um, we have an independent third party group inside of Oak Tree, which reports up to our CFO, which does the valuations for all of Oak Tree. So it's not our investment professionals opining on the value. Um, so, and also since we uh, co-invest with okay, a number of- Okay, for one second. Yeah. That's a rule. So like the rules just change that uh, deal teams can no longer drive valuation processes. It has to be driven out of a, a risk group. Yeah. And so that's like, again, you're protected by law. Yeah, and we did that five years right. ago. Right. So we, <laughs> we were a little bit ahead of the times. So, but thank you for pointing that out. Because that's, that's good for the entire BDC industry, right? Um, so we have that separate uh, unit, which has been doing it for five years now. Um, we have, uh, we co-invest with some of our ERISA accounts, so quarterly we're actually forced to do third-party valuations. So most of our portfolio is looked at quarterly, if not annually, every time. Um, so we have rigorous procedures, multiple boards, um, you know, different levels of approvers. So, you know, it's, it's not kind of the Wild West as it might have been, you know, a couple of uh, ten years ago or so. So, Yeah, I mean, I have nothing to add to that. I think we all follow very robust valuation process. The one thing I would say is that, um, at the end of the day, obviously, you know, today's NAV is important, but what, what's really more relevant is what is the realized loss history? You can mark something at 90, 95, it's interesting, but what happened to that loan when it got repaid? Did it get repaid at par? Was there a loss? Was there a credit loss? So if we're, people really want to evaluate different BDC managers and whether they should buy their BDCs, you obviously should look at the portfolios, the yields, but at the end of the day, you should look at the manager's investment performance historically. What has their loss position been? So a number of you, all of you have grown over the last several years your public BDC, either through an equity raise, an ATM, an, a merger with uh, an affiliate, uh, or maybe a third party acquisition. Um, what we hear from investors is, well, growth is good for the manager, but what's in it for the shareholder? Um, that's always kind of the elephant in the room. And so, um, you know, Matt, I'll start with you. Anything you'd like to kind of if somebody says, well, you're growing for growth's sake, what's in it for the shareholder? From your perspective as your organization has thought through it, um, I assume it wasn't whimsical and they just woke up one day and said, this is a good idea, let's try this. So if you wouldn't mind sharing your thought process. Yeah, Oak Tree takes a very conservative approach when it comes to equity and fundraising. You can look at our AUM growth over time. and We, we, we let the market environment and investable universe kind of dictate how much we're going to deploy, how much we're going to raise and we let that guide us. And you can see that with our BDC, which how we've run leverage over the past you know, five years. We were actually one of the lower levered BDCs when we came into COVID. Um, we did launch a small ATM program back in February of this year. We raised around 20 million and we deployed it into high quality assets. And we were able to uh, sell at a premium, so it was accretive to all shareholders. But it was a very small program and it was only alongside an interesting investment opportunity. Um, John, I know your organization has done the ATM as well. We, we have, and we, we, we have grown. We have also grown through, through raising uh, private BDCs. And you know, here's the deal about direct lending. Uh, you know, our strategy is essentially in direct lending is to have access to the best deals. Uh, we're a sponsor-oriented lender. To have access to the best sponsor-led deals, you, you have to be relevant to those sponsors. So if we think Toma Bravo is a great sponsor, 
uh, and, they're do and they're growing and they're doing bigger deals, uh, if we stay at the same size and, and keep our ticket size small, we're not going to get access to those great deals. So it, it, for us, it's very simple. We just track uh, what our clients' needs are. And if our clients need more capital or are doing bigger deals, it's imperative uh, for us to, to, to get bigger so that we can access those high-quality deals. It's just, it's just a very different world than the syndicated markets, which are well, uh, you know, more democratic. You know, everyone sort of has a shot to buy the loan. Uh, and and, and uh, in the direct world, it's just it's it's much more of a club, and you definitely want to get access to that club. Michael, yeah, I'd, I'd say um, the only time we really we have raised equity uh, at the public BDC levels is to fund an acquisition, which was accretive to the shareholders. So we've done a series of acquisitions within the BDC, and we basically borrowed money to buy it and then reload the balance sheet by doing it. We've chosen to do that for. One, the, the right reason, which is we want our shareholders to benefit from our growth. And the other is that we actually personally own about 8% of the BDC personally. So we, we act as shareholders all day long. And we're not going to do something that's going to compromise our ownership of our, our, of our company. Ted, you've been an uh, active acquirer. Um, so any additional thoughts that you have on why it's been beneficial to the Portman Ridge shareholders, for example? Um, so I agree with everything these guys said. I mean, obviously scale matters. But if you look, if you back test all the BDCs that we bought, they all came to the same conclusion, which is they just weren't relevant, and they were they were forced to John's point. They were being adversely selected. So they all they all started trying to do their own deals. They all, they all followed the very similar path. They all tried to do their own deals. They were based on very small companies. They had losses, so they taxed to being a club player, and that's not a franchise business. Um, and so. All of the BDCs that we bought had a really hard time competing with the three, three guys up here and ultimately decided that you know, it was time to, to move on. So people have been calling for consolidation in our space for 20 years, and you've seen a lot of it. You know, we bought six BDCs. Um, you know, uh, there's one announced last week where Crescent bought First Eagle, and you know, you're seeing consolidation in our space. The small players are getting rolled up into the larger players. And the reason it's good for our shareholders is it gives us more scale, but also you know, we cut a lot of costs. So you need one audit, you need one CFO. So when we roll in these BDC platforms, typically, you know, our CFO doesn't get paid a lot more money when we you know, acquire new guys. So like, you fire the CEO, you don't need any people, you get rid of the audit, you get rid of the tax, you get rid of their board. And so there's big cost synergies to, you know, in, in all these M&A processes. And, you know, our theory on the investment banking side has been any industry should have a situation where the other, some entities are subscale, have not met investors' expectations, it's a natural byproduct. I don't care what industry you're in, and you've been seeing that within the BDC space. So we think that's healthy, we think that's good for investors. A lot of the BDCs that have been merged away, or are merging away, were entities that have disappointed investors. Now they've gone to homes where it's been um, more consistent delivery of what the shareholder expectations have been. Um, yeah, and, and, and if you look at, if you bifurcate BDCs like that, the lowest quartile BDCs have been the worst fundamental performers, not just stock price performers. And so like, you know, the data, the data would support that. So Michael touched on this a little bit about take a look at realized losses. So ignoring your own company for a moment, if somebody in the audience said, hey, before I invest in a BDC, what should I be thinking about? Not your company, but in general. What, would you, what advice would you provide? Ted? Well, losses as an industry have averaged 60 basis points uh, since 2004. So I think that's, a, and that's just an industry. And as Michael said, you know, um, you know again, for, for, the, for the industry's first couple of years, it was mezzanine financed. And also the thing that Michael didn't mention is uh, very um, uh, much less institutional liability side. So you know, they're funded by bank revolvers. Those revolvers can get pulled. Today, you know, people are, have access to institutional bond deals and other things. So you've had 60 basis points of losses, which always seems low to me, by the way, but it's 60 basis points of losses since 2004, and that's based on a, uh, you know, today I would, I would argue that people have safer assets than historically. So again, I don't know where losses will go, but that is the, that's the historical number. John? Yeah, I mean, if I were evaluating a BDC for my own account, I guess, look, I, I would look at the, all the obvious track record data points uh, but I'd also look for a manager that, that really has transparency in the way they talk about their business and, and, uh, and, uh, and sort of uh, and, and disclose the quality of their book. Uh, because, you know, I think the biggest struggle that I have when I think about our industry and getting bigger and being more relevant to investors 
is that at the end of the day, we're, we are a little bit black boxy. We have all these loans uh, for all these random companies. And if I were to look at Ted's book, for example, I, you know, I'm in the business and I'd probably know 20% of the companies, right? So if I only know 20% of the companies, what's an average investment analyst gonna know? So we just have to, as an industry, figure out a way to, to provide that greater transparency so we can give you know, investors comfort about just the, the quality and stability of the, of, of the portfolios. Matt, other thoughts that you have? Um, it's just to echo what these guys have been saying. Uh, Scott, size and scale obviously are two big ones because you have to be a powerful player. You have to have the AUM to be relevant to sponsors or other companies. You got to have a great relationship with the banks. So you, those smaller players, like Ted said, are the worst performing, and they are that way because they're not relevant to either on the asset side or liability side of the balance sheet. And then track record like John was talking about. I mean, Oak Tree's been around for 30 years investing in, you know, over various market cycles. We have a distressed DNA, so we, we analyze all the downsides of every company we do. And that's very important when you're, especially in this market, right, with all the new direct lenders that have come in over the past 10 years when we haven't had a distress cycle. Um, not a lot of people have been tested um, in the past couple of years. So we'll see how this period of volatility plays out. Michael, yeah. anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I, the one thing I would add, and. and back to my comment earlier about, you know, we're facing down a recession here is, is to try to really analyze what the portfolio is made up of. Look at what industry concentrations there are. Are these industries that will fare well in a, in a downward economy? Are, are these portfolios all cash flow loans? Are there, is there, is there an asset based lending component, which tends to do better in a downturn? I would really want to try to, and, and but Back to the early point, it, it's, it is hard to get that transparency. It's transparency we try to be. As an as a, as a outside investor, it's really hard to do what I'm proposing to do. Um, some of the research analysts do a really good job of, of, of pushing us and getting that data. But to me, it's all about asset selection at this point in time. And so being able to understand what these portfolios are and how they may or may not perform uh, in a difficult time is critical. And one thing I'd add to the comments that Ted said, um, fortunately or unfortunately, I've been leading the BDC investment banking practice from my firm prior to the great financial crisis. Before the financial crisis, the BDCs in general were very proud of highlighting the lowest cost of credit facility they had. So they did one year revolvers, and, they, and that's pretty much what they did because five year unsecured debt was expensive. So it was all about this march to lowest possible cost, and then obviously lessons learned. So now when you look at the space, and each of these panelists have this, is a diversified liability stream. Yeah. They have unsecured debt, and it's laddered. They also have credit facilities, and those sorts of things. So there's additional dry powder. So as you think about potential stress, which we can all debate about where we are in the economy, the point is, is that these BDCs are better positioned today, in my opinion, versus where they were five, 10 years ago, not only because of that liability structure, but also the public entities have benefited from the overall platform and the overall platform's relationships with the largest credit providers on, you know, on Wall Street. So it's not just Al Waffenberg LLC showing up saying, I've got this idea. Now you're part of these larger platforms and they're taking a holistic approach to the overall relationship and that's benefiting, in my opinion, the shareholders. Um, just add that, to, to, just to double down that, I think the importance of looking at the liability side is critical. We saw as recently as two years ago in the depths of COVID that there were some very well-heeled large asset managers who had BDCs that were funded only by bank debt. And given the market to market volatility, they were forced to go out and do rights offerings and dilute all the shareholders to prop up the balance sheets. And these are brand name people that you would recognize that you would say, why do they do that? They did it because they wanted to keep cheap debt yeah. and not term out their liabilities. Whereas, you know, the trend has been, towards what Al saying, to make sure your balance sheet is bulletproof so that if there is a downturn in market volatility, you can still do the right thing as a, as a manager and not be forced to do things on behalf of your borrowers. And, th and those, those are also the BDCs out there uh, talking about how we're all like, you know, idiots for uh, uh, our higher cost of capital, you know, just to <laughs> add that in there. The so, um, can I make one more comment, actually? The Please. other thing I think is important is to distinguish between you know, what the four of us do and what other, some other BDCs do. So historically, venture lenders have traded a big premium to us. And if I was going to think about like where stresses are going to occur and where there's going to be losses, 
you know, I'm not sure that premium is going to is going to continue. You know, so like all of our stocks trade at huge discounts to market. And again, I feel really good about these guys' portfolios. And again, like when we talk about black boxy, you know, some of the you know these tech companies that obviously have been supported by venture capital and by growth and by SPACs and by exits. You know, it'll be interesting to see what happens with loss history. And some, so like not all, my point is not all BDCs are created equal. Like we don't all do the same thing. And so I would distinguish between what each of these BDCs are doing, and um, and I think you're going to see very very different outcomes. You know, in the next couple of years. And all of you have been very complimentary of each other, and that's great. Um, but one thing I would you say want to is, start is insult each other. No, no, no. We're not going to do that. Okay. We're not going to do that. But what I, I we're not going to do that. I promise everybody we wouldn't be that uh, panel discussion where people start throwing stuff at each other. With that said, each of you have a differentiated feature that you offer to your shareholders. And it's not necessarily a slight against other BDC panelists here, but each of you have taken a slightly different approach to deliver returns. And so, you know, Michael, you have stayed away from some traditional middle market lending and done some niche lending portfolio companies. Would you describe what you've done sure. there and how you've differentiated yourself within the BDC space? Yeah. We, we made a decision coming out of the, the great financial crisis that when we saw banks being forced to exit what we thought were attractive asset-based lending businesses that we were going to dive into it ourselves. And so over the course of the last seven, eight, nine, ten years, we've done a series of acquisitions underneath the BDC, taking advantage of the fact that we have permanent capital to add different strategies that are all asset-based lending strategies. For example, we have an equipment leasing business. Um, we have a non-traditional ABL business where we lend to companies that are going through transition. We have a working capital asset-based lending business. Uh, we have an investment grade uh, equipment finance business. These are all businesses that generate you know, double digit return on equity and have default rates and loss rates that are lower than cash flow lending. We, we looked at the data over 30, 40 years, the default rates for asset based lending and loss rates are, are de minimis. So we've chosen to diversify our earnings stream by going after other niches. And John at New Mountain, you've tried to leverage the institutional knowledge in certain subsectors and in certain industry verticals. Um, anything you'd like to add on how you've differentiated yourselves at the BDC? Sure. When I, when, when I make pitch, uh, a pitch to investors, the number one thing I want investors to know about New Mountain is that we feel strongly that we have a research advantage. And that research advantage is really driven by the fact that we have an integrated business model uh, where we leverage the knowledge base of our private equity uh, business. And specifically, uh, in private equity, we identify sectors of the economy that we think are going to grow no matter what the economic environment looks like. So good, growthful sectors that are uh, they're structurally advantaged. And then we hire a tremendous amount of operating partners and, 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 and real industry resources to make great private equity inv best investments. And, and what I do is I tap into those, those executives uh, th that, that help our private equity team. They're also tasked with helping the credit team pick really good credits within the sectors they know well. So we're not just a team of, of, of guys and girls sitting in front of Bloomberg's trying to figure out a credit. We only make a credit investment if we have real industry knowledge that connects to the credit we're looking to invest in. Matt? Uh, so we take a unique approach to our BDC, and we originate through three channels pretty much. One non-sponsor, this is kind of off the run lending to public companies, founder-owned businesses or other companies not owned by private equity shops. Typically here we can get better yields um, and better terms because uh, they're not backed by a private equity shop that's throwing out a term sheet to 10 direct lenders. So we have good relationships across the business with our platform that we can get that inflow. Second, we just do uh, your typical sponsor back lending that a lot of other competitors do. But we focus with some of the larger tier sponsors that we have good relationships with that have the subject area expertise. Um, and we do some kind of off the run uh, uh, deals there as well. But the third leg is we do a lot of public market investing. So at times of dislocation, since we have that big high yield and syndicated loan group and a big trading desk, we can be very powerful when we're going in on new deals, take down some of the hung deals that have been in the market recently, um, and really add value to our shareholders by being advantageous in that market and finding relative value kind of across the three um, during the, any particular time. Ted? Yeah, so we're, we're kind of a combination of, of all three, which is we do have a decent non-sponsor business. But we're, we're, we're just like what John said. We're, we're really good at six sectors, and we're not good at anything else. So we just do those six sectors. 
and we typically avoid consumer just because we're not good at it. So like most of our business is B2B. So if you look at our performance through the crisis, you know, we really performed well. And the reason we perform well is just because you know, we just don't have a lot of consumer exposure. And it, it's, it's, a lot of it's just because you know, there's people who are smarter at that business than us. So we, we try to stick to our six, seven sectors. We leverage off the firm's resources, very similar. We have a big non-sponsor component to our business. And, um, and, and uh, you know, I think that serves as well. So I can talk to these four people all day long, and we've got about five more minutes left. I do want to give the opportunity, and I've got more questions, but I do want to give the opportunity to the audience in case somebody has a pressing question that they want to raise, certainly want to give you that option. If not, it's perfectly fine. Okay. Um, the economy. Before we do that, I, yeah. we talked a lot about scale. Yeah. There's also, um, my personal opinion, there's, there's some negativities about scale. Yes. Having too much money. Yes. And you've seen one of the, you, you saw up until we hit the summer, a huge explosion of demand for private credit. And you saw managers raise money hand over fist to tune up you know, a billion plus a month into certain vehicles. Which means they're basically forced to change their investment strategy from being kind of middle market direct lenders to basically being a substitute for the broadly syndicated loan market. So those portfolios are probably ones that I'd want to stay away with from because they tend to be structured very poorly. Uh, BSL market for the last several years has had no covenants. The leverage has been extremely high. And those portfolios will probably, they might perform long term, but at least from a mark to market perspective, should have real downside. My point is that there does become a point where scale across the platform does become a negative because it has the potential to change investment managers' investment strategy to be able to um, invest at that growth rate. Yeah, um, and that goes to my comments earlier around our conservative approach for raising money and, and a lot of the new entrants that have come into the market and they haven't been tested with, with the inflow, right? It's just been just spent a ton of money into private credit in the last five years. And actually, to Michael's point, I, something that like blew my mind actually, which I should send it to you guys, like I thought it was interesting. I did a roadshow on Monday, so all these numbers are fresh. <laughs> uh, uh, I looked at this, this, the total stock price performance over the last three years of all BDCs, and to Michael's point, the bottom quartile of performers were the top, like the, the like were some of the very very largest BDCs, which kind of surprised me actually. Um, so some of, like I think the market's beginning to, to, you know, the market's, you know, the market obviously is sophisticated. So in the bottom quartile, I think like something like, you know, four or five of the larger BDCs who are, you know, what I would describe as asset accumulators, um, you know, are some of the worst performing equities. So I think the market's beginning to discern uh, the same theme that Michael's talking about. So we've got a couple minutes left. In terms of your vintage that you're seeing coming up right now in terms of new originations in light of the economy. I guess covenants going higher are more difficult and or asset yields, are they going up or are you taking more of an approach of, hey, we're taking safer credits and trying to keep the asset yields kind of comparable? Quick answers. John? Uh, asset yields are going up and leverage is going down. Okay. <laughs> Doctor's Ted? getting better. All right. Yeah, and, also, and also to Matt's point, you know, one second thing, is you know, we bought bank debt yesterday against a software company. Uh, at four times lever on a company that they bought was bought a year ago for 20 times EBITDA, and it's got a 12% current yield and an 18% yield of maturity. So but there's some really interesting opportunities out there, and I can't conceive of a way we're going to lose money on that. Um, and so, uh, so I, I, everything John said, I agree with. <laughs> yeah, um, and the other thing over the last couple of years, EBITDA ad backs have been so aggressive. Um, we looked at a deal recently where they marked. $20 million EBITDA company to about 80. We believe it's probably 20 to 40. Um, but I would say broadly, that has been getting better and, and not as aggressive as it has been. So higher yields, be, uh, lower LTVs, better leverage points, you know, more clean EBITDA versus what it was. Um, so that, and, you know, some of the direct lenders have pulled back a little bit um, in general. I think the investing environment is going to be good for the next uh, couple quarters. Yeah, I think, look, we're, we're licking our chops. I think this has been the best potential coming forward investment environment we've seen in a long, long time. And the interesting thing is that not everyone is going to take advantage of it because I think you made the point earlier, you know, BDCs 
are regulated in that they can only incur a certain amount of leverage. And the rating agencies only allow us to incur a certain amount of leverage, one and a quarter, one and a half times, depending on your situation. A lot of BDCs came into the summer already levered at one and a quarter, one and a half times. So what does that mean? They don't have any dry powder to take advantage of it. And historically, a lot of the dry powder came from being repaid on loans. When you're in an environment we're in now with rising rates and facing recession, you're not getting loan repayments. So where people may talk about this great investment environment, they may not be able to take advantage of it because they ran fully levered coming into the cycle. Yeah, so you, you should check, sir. You should check how much dry powder they actually have in their leverage points. Because um, once you start ticking up to that one and a half or higher, uh, you start bringing that 2x cap of the BDCs into risk. And then also you have the banks that you know, like we saw during COVID, they could crack down on some of the BDCs as well. So it's important to have some unsecured debt in your capital structure on the liability side to support you when you want to be aggressive and invest in this environment. Well, yeah, I was going to say, oh, go, sorry. Please, Ted, go ahead. There's this myth. I think there's a myth out there that the direct lending community is unlimited amounts of capital. And we're seeing it now. Like, people, people are very capital constrained. You know, fundraising slow way down for some of these retail platforms. Um, number two is, you know, like a lot of direct lending uh, uh, competitors jumped in to, to basically backfill into the syndicated markets. And five years ago, you know, a billion dollar unit tranche. I remember Blackstone did the first billion dollar unit tranche. I was gonna say that's like six years ago, maybe. And now it's like, you know, guys are writing three billion dollar unit tranches all over the place. <coughs> and that actually is very capital consumptive and people are relatively capital constrained. And I think Matt made the comment earlier, which is true, is in 2020, lenders really tightened up on the direct uh, certain direct lending uh, firms. Um, and I think you know, that's something that people should be aware of you know, going forward. So you should also look at the liability structure that some of the direct lending community has. Well, I want to personally thank each of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules. This has been a, a very nice panel. I'm sure everybody appreciated it. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.